David. Uh, Hi. How the heck are you? You know, we have a we have a really long past. Like you and I'm I've, I'm old enough where I don't remember where yeah. it started. Where did it start? I, I do, I do remember it. And I mean, we'll get into it in a second, but I remember you being one of the first people that I knew that booked a series regular. Do you know what I mean? And, you know, at, I feel like in my mind's eye, I see you in a mail room um, somewhere. Like we were in, you worked at an agent's office or something like that. And you were in a mail room. Um, uh, Martha might've been there too. Like, do you know what I mean? Martha Bowles was our friend. Yeah. And I, okay, I feel I like, so I feel like somewhere I can't piece it all together, but I feel like we've, 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 we've definitely had a, a long past together. brother. Now so that you like, jogged my memory, do you want to know where it was? Where was it? Um, so funny enough, uh, when I got signed by my, at that point, biggest commercial agent that I had ever had mm -hmm. off agency. Yeah. Um, I immediately, they'd already signed me, but I immediately said, Hey, can I volunteer here once a week? Cause I want to learn how commercials and agents were mm. and they're like yes we absolutely accept this so apparently a lot of people did at the time and i'm so glad i did i probably volunteered there once a week for a year mm -hmm. um which is funny because a lot of people are like you worked at my agent's office no i didn't i was just a client who just happened to volunteer but it gave me so much insight not only did i get to know some casting directors but it gave me insight to the good and the bad of the industry i saw how things were submitted in fact Hope I'm not getting them in trouble by saying it. <laughs> um, whenever somebody submitted, because this we're talking about the old days with dinosaurs when you so long, this mail, is so long ago. You know? Yeah, I was the one opening the envelope. So like, whether or not you got a meeting wasn't up to me. But if you were a friend of mine, I'm like, oh, you should meet with this person. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, I was the one doing it, and I got to see how many actors ask for reschedules, how many don't show up to auditions, how many don't update their headshots. And it was really, really educational. And the funny thing is I met so many people I now consider friends there. I think half of which mistakenly think I worked there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess I, I didn't even think about it, but I didn't, I, I, you know, I, I always thought you worked there. But, but we also had a, another thing, I, I've told you this story, you probably don't remember it, but you know, we were up for one of the same roles together. And uh, <laughs> yes, right. I no theatrically. Wait, which one? Right, theatrically, we were up for the same roles. We had gone back, you know, for well, I had to do a first call for it, and then went to producer session, and um, I was I was pinned for it too. Do you want to know what it was for? Yes, Moonlight. Oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> David, David booked it, you all. I got beat out by David. But I think that story more than anything helps you understand, me understood that like, sometimes they don't know what they're looking for, right? And it's not like it could be different colors or, you know, bodies, whatever. And so you were just more that guy. I can't remember his name or something like that. Uh, but Logan, funny. Logan, that was, I, that I, was I, a I one day guest star. Well, it's just funny because it was uh, that was a one day guest star. I remember the audition. I, I had pre read. I love that you think that I'm that important ever, let alone now. But uh, uh, that was a one day guest star pre read. Mm. That I don't actually under. I don't. I, that's one of the stories I don't know the full scope of. I have one or two if you don't mind uh, that I'll yeah, tell you no. in regard to what you just said. Mm -hmm. But that one I actually pre read. I don't think I even had a call back or went to producers. I think yeah. I pre read it. However, the funny thing is. You know, the number of people I have the exact same story you just told me about, you know, like mm -hmm. friends, my friend Drew Powell, who's now on, he was on Gotham. Now he's in movies all over the place. He and I were both up for Cliff on Ugly Betty. Mm -hmm. And I was the brand new one that no one knew. And I'm looking around the room. I'm like, any one of these people is going to book it over me. Yeah. Um, I have so many stories like that. And then I also have ones where. For I mean, I don't think we're breaking any NDAs today, no, but so no good. one's zooming, please. <laughs> um, I went in for Transformers 2 mm -hmm. uh, to play the role of a character named Jonah, uh -huh. described as a Jonah Hill type, uh -huh. who spoke and acted like Jonah Hill. Right. And right after I left the audition, I found out they offered it to Jonah Hill. <laughs> to Jonah. <laughs> and now the funny thing is he turned it down and they turned it into two other roles, but I'm like, did you call me in to be more Jonah Hill than Jonah Hill? <laughs> what are we supposed to do with that? And it's a funny thing in this industry, and it's part of the reason, and I think you believe this, because 
we were still friends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I always say it's harder now that everyone's in their phones, but befriend your competition, not for any nefarious purpose, but because they're the people you're going to see every day. Well, mm -hmm. if you have in-room auditions. They're the people who you're you're competing against, but more than anything, there's nothing better than that saying and that feeling of, if I don't get it, I hope you do. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that so much. And it, and it changed my career a long time ago when I first realized it. And the number of times, you know, it's kind of like leapfrog in this industry. The people who work, you know, you might go years without working, it sucks. But the people who work, you book this one, I book the next one, you know, mm -hmm. like if things are all equal and fair, which industry struggles with but um <laughs> yeah. and if you can just accept that and realize that if that door didn't open for you it wasn't your door and mm -hmm. be happy for the person whose door it was then i think that changes everything for you you know yeah. well you got to get there i believe yeah. like it takes a bit to get there you know i had a guest on uh in season two uh emerson brooks where i called him oh. my acting nemesis <laughs> no, emerson, he and i used to wait tables together yeah and we used to joke about what well, we joked about like i would walk in there and he would he would say oh dewan's here so he's gonna get it and i would be looking at him like emerson's here you know because we didn't you know talk and then once we started talking it was just kind of like i really do hope one of us gets it if it doesn't me it's you and you you but it takes a bit to get there because i think the industry makes it feel like it's a zero-sum game yeah and right? also sadly i hate to say that even the other side of it can be problem Funny enough, the final audition I had before the pandemic started 100 years ago, mm -hmm. um, I walked in. It was for a series regular. Oh, sorry, I just got really excited that I had an audition. Uh, <laughs> it was for a series regular on a new CBS show, and mm -hmm. I wanted it so bad, which is always dangerous. And I walked in, and I saw my friend, who I consider one of the, oh, no, you're going to get it. Mm -hmm. you, know, like you walk mm -hmm. in the room, and you're like, oh, why am I even here? Yeah. And the funniest thing is he said to me, He's like, oh, when I read this, I thought of you. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, but what's funny is in that moment, it made me more nervous because I went, oh, it's my job to lose. You know what I mean? Yeah. Actually being positive almost makes me stress out more. So it, it's the funny thing I've noticed, I'm sure you have as well as a coach and as a teacher, let alone as an actor. We as performers, as artists are always trying to self-sabotage. Mm. Always. Mm -hmm. And you have to find the hopefully more positive way to move past that. And I find it's supporting each other, you know, mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean to not be realistic and say, you know, I really wanted that job, you know, yeah. but it's to say, I really wanted that job, but I didn't get it. I'm so stoked that you did. I can't wait to watch it. You know, So you talk about self-sabotaging. I, I mean, I know what that means in my mind, but what do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? Like, it, we're always trying to, what do you, what do you mean? Um, I mean, there's a few examples. Uh, as a coach, I can tell you, I cannot, the number of times people show up having like barely looked at sides. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I can get you there, but if you would have been a little prepared, yeah. you would have absolutely felt even more confident. Or the number of times people, uh, funny enough, in my ongoing class right now, this month, we're focusing on find the facts and the script analysis before you start layering on choices, because a lot of times you'll force yourself down the wrong path. Um, of course, there's in the room where people either are too needy. You know, if you want the job, it emanates off of you. Um, or too blase, they don't take it seriously. You know, my saying, and this is horrible math, but my saying has always been agents make 10%, but we have to do 90% of the work. And also, in the union, this is before the merger, but in Screen Actors Guild, uh, what is it, 1% of Screen Actors Guild makes a living acting. And so if you wanna be in that 1%, do 99% more work than anyone. And I find a lot of actors self-sabotage from the minute they get the audition. Uh, I'm not right for this because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you have the audition, somebody thought you were right for it. Or um, you walk in and you're like, I'm not gonna get it, this person is. You're both completely different people no matter how alike you look. Uh, or simply not putting in the time. And I do this, I'm a great teacher and a coach, and that takes a lot for me to say that. If you know me, you know I have I <laughs> almost no ego. Um, I should, but I don't. Uh, and I'll get an audition, and I get on the actor horse blinders where I start doing all the things I coach and teach people not to do and have to fight it. And especially, I'm like, okay, I got 24 hours. Got to learn these lines. Got to learn the character. Oh, there's a new episode of Picard is there, you know? 
<laughs> I found myself at the end of the episode, like, why did I just waste an hour watching television? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's really easy to do that, especially in the world of self tapes and social media that we're doing uh. and stuff. And I find having to remind yourself, um, not to go on too much of a tangent, but having to remind yourself of that feeling when you first started the, I came here at 20 something and I'm like, everyone's like, it's impossible. And you go, not for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find reminding yourself that even as you get older, that is this what you want to do? Fight for it, yeah. earn it. Mm. I love that. Um, I, you know, speaking of the, the, there's so many things that you just said that were gold and I want to go back to self tapes. I want to go back to starting from, you know, the process, but you know, I mentioned earlier, you were one of those first people that I remember booking series regulars and going off and shooting, you know, um, Eli for such a long, you know, and I remember being like watching Stargate and all that, you know, and then, you know, getting the next level agents and just all of that happening when we were in our 20s, right? When we we're in our 20s, like, how is that? How was that road? And then how is that road now? You know, because when we think there, we think like you are going to be the next Jonah Hill, right? Like right when the <laughs> you're I like mean, you know, to the <laughs> yeah. First of all, can you say that? Can you write that and sign it and send it to everyone? Yeah. Um, so here's the here's the and I'm not in any way being pessimistic, but I always not only as a teacher and tell the truth, speak also it as an advisor. You know, I teach master uh -huh. classes at SAG and and stuff, and uh -huh. I always try to tell people like I'm not here to lie to you. And the funny thing is, what I learned early on, even before I had that journey. You know, one of my very six very successful friends, like one of those like names you recognize people, told me very early on, save your money. Mm -hmm. uh, they're like, when you book a job, save your money, because that might be the only job you book for a while. No matter how big, you know, you hear stories like Will Smith did Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and was bankrupt in the first season because he spent it. Mm -hmm. You hear other things where people book a huge job and then they don't work for five years. And so for better or for worse, I took that to heart. And the funny thing with my career and and everyone's career is different. So I can only right. reach from where I came from. I moved here and came from theater, I have a BFA and, and did not know really TV film and kind of got a crash course. And I spent years doing everything wrong <laughs> and uh, trying to learn. And then the funny thing is, I kind of rose from co star to guest star to recurring guest star to series regular extremely quickly, uh, especially compared to other people. I even though I had been here for some time, I think I did that whole co-star to series regular within like two and a half years, three years. And what's funny is on the other end of it, after the series, and I'll get to that in a second, what ended up happening was I realized it might've been too fast because I came back because we were filming Stargate in Canada and I was kind of out of sight, out of mind. Plus just to address it, I lost on purpose I decided to lose weight during Stargate. I gained it for Ugly Betty, lost it for Stargate. And, um, and I came back different. And as my friend Todd Sashwick says, I rebranded Coke without telling anyone. And it was a struggle because either they knew me as something else or they didn't know me. And that's the problem. I rose, not patting myself on the back, I rose quickly enough where half the town knew me and the other half of town didn't know why they didn't know me. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of came back to this interesting climate in my career where it was, it was like I would go in for a name and in the very next audition, I'd be going in for like a nothing, nobody. Mm. And, and I, I found it kind of, um, use the language, a mind fuck. I was going to uh, say, what did it do to your mind? I was just going to say, like, I'm getting what? anxiety listening to that. <laughs> Right? Yeah, but like, yeah, it was tough. You know, it's a funny thing. And I actually, I haven't really talked about this much. It's a funny thing. So I had done quite a few things that I was, I mean, almost everything I've done, I'm pretty proud of. Like I, I had a blast yeah. doing it and I love doing what we do. Um, Ugly Betty made my career. Like overnight things changed. Mm -hmm. uh, all of a sudden I was getting for rooms that I couldn't get in for before. And I switched representation, same thing. And then I booked this series that honestly, uh, I was changing managers when I had auditioned for Stargate. And six of the seven managers I met with said, don't take Stargate. Mm. They said, we don't want you to go off to Canada and do a sci-fi show. This is back when sci-fi had more of a stink on it. Um, mm. The genre, not the channel. And um, 
And one said, you should take it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, the series regular. I'm absolutely yeah. going to take it. Yeah. Um, and I'm very proud of the work. But interestingly, I sort of understand what they meant. Leaving for two years, right when people were getting to know me, and then coming back thinner at all. I'd only lost 45 pounds then, and I've since lost a full 85, 90 pounds. Was really tough. My show was canceled while we were on hiatus. I wasn't expecting it to be canceled. Um, I looked completely different. I didn't even have a place to live. I was living over at like the Oakwood. Uh, mm -hmm. I was just planning to be here for three months. And also, not to lay too much on you, what I discovered at that time that I wholeheartedly believed, before Stargate, I would go into an audition and I would destroy. I knew I would do my job. And it was just a matter of which one's going to be mine, you know? And that's not mm -hmm. ego. It's just I put in that much work. I knew I was doing good work. Mm -hmm. Then I went off and did a series. And in two years, I auditioned twice. Because we, we did 20 episodes a season. So, like, my mm -hmm. only break was December, January. Nobody's auditioning in December, January. So I really didn't audition. And I moved back. All of a sudden, the week after I'm back, I'm back into pilot season. And the busiest pilot season I've ever had, because I just switched to a bigger agency, which was a mistake. And um, all of a sudden, I wasn't feeling confident anymore. 50% mm -hmm. of the time, it felt like I was falling on my face during an audition, and I wasn't used to it, and it freaked me out. So, wait, what, wait, what shifted there? Because you, came, you just came from this space of like, I can piss in this thing and it's going to be great, to now you're telling me that like you were not confident. Like, what? Like, the the weight loss made that change so well i'll tell you I, it took okay. me a minute so i didn't know what was going on and i disappeared mm -hmm. i'd also gone through it was a perfect storm of crap i had also gone through the hardest breakup of my life right before it mm -hmm. happened um i also had a medical thing going on so like everything combined i fell into like motivational books i was reading every self-help book i could get my hand on i started taking master classes around town ivana chubbuck warner laughlin margie haber everywhere leslie mm -hmm. khan um, uh, John Rosenfeld, everybody, everybody had ever studied with or thought about. And it, it was kind of like I was falling and just trying to grab onto something. Stan Kirsch. Like when Stan I, because you kept, mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you know what I realized then, and I do believe now, the acting muscle and the audition muscle are two separate muscles. Mm -hmm. They work mm -hmm. in tandem. I did not know that at the time. So for two years, I was, I was a decent actor, but I was getting better and better and better and better. This audition muscle was atrophying. It wasn't auditioning. So all of a sudden, to have to jump back into auditions, let alone back then, things were busy. I had like three pilot auditions in a day. So that's like 21 pages of material, three separate characters, driving from Sony to Warner Brothers back to Sony. You know, you're like, I'm literally changing my pants and shoes on the 405. Like, you're like, I'm driving. It's horribly dangerous. <laughs> Um, and, and then on top of that, to not feel, you can't just jump into a marathon after being a couch potato for three years, you know, yeah. and not that I was, but, and so that's what it was for me. I realized my mindset was off. I realized I was out of practice. I realized my confidence had been rocked because also I had lost only 45 pounds, but I was suddenly going in for like the romantic lead. Mm -hmm. And I, I had not gotten there yet in my head. Like I went in for Nick on new girl. Mm. And, I went into that going, I felt like Big Bird on the Death Star. I'm like, I don't belong here. What's going on? I'm in the wrong show. Um, and so all of those things kind of made it tough. And I wish I knew then what I know now, which is that they're separate muscles that you have to put in the time and the work. And that I had kind of solid, I've now solidified my process so much so that I teach it. Um, it's not really a technique, but I teach it. But at the time, you study Leslie Kahn or Stan, right? So... You know, Stan. a lot of people who study with Leslie, Stan, John kind of have that same core thing, which, which I think is good um, or bad. Um, and what I learned when I studied at Leslie's was I was doing the right thing. I was just doing it instinctually. And them naming it, saying, this is a reversal. This is called a thought. I could make sure I did it every time. Mm -hmm. Consistency. And that's what I learned looking back. That's what I should have learned and I learned since. It's what is your process? Are you doing it? Yep. Is your head in the right space? And the biggest thing I think is remembering and realizing that it's not me trying to get a job. It's me 
performing a one man show for the people who bought tickets. And that's the, I mean, I've been saying this for years and then Brian Cranston said it and he's much more famous. So everyone thinks he said it first and fine. Yeah, he probably did. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but that's the biggest thing for me now. And, and I wish I could whisper it to myself back then. Stop trying to get the job, you know, stop worrying about your shows over, get another job and focus on here's how I see it. Have a nice day. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was, I, I, I double down on what you uh, are saying, and I have to say, you know, um, right now I feel any actor that you know goes to my program or I talk to or, or I work with, the number one thing I think actors are doing are trying to memorize their lines well oh, and just trying to just they're trying to just um and i've been guilty you know that you, if you spot right. it you got it right you spot it you got it. like but i've been guilty about but it's about like memorizing their lines and they're not paying attention to the story and the character and i think that is one of the keys that's missing and it's been about like my season three of the podcast is talking about character a little bit more um I, I 100% agree with that. What, what, you, what you just said is exactly. I mean, first of all, I'm sure you do this all the time too. I was surprised because I started word of mouth coaching for a while and then it wasn't mm -hmm. years before I started a business doing it. Mm -hmm. And what I find myself saying more than anything to every client is you're enough. Go ahead. You are enough. Because so many people are like, they're looking for this. Let me be it. Or like you said, they're trying to memorize, especially before they know what's going on. And I always tell people, no one has ever booked a job because they knew the lines. The best memorizer yeah. is not the <laughs> Now, now yeah. don't get me wrong. There are some casting directors out there that we are friends with that are mm -hmm. like, be word perfect, do not improvise. And I agree with them. I, yeah. I believe you should be word perfect because yeah. you put in that much time. But here's the big thing. And I think, I think you're also friends with them. You know Adam Shapiro? Oh, I don't. Uh, my no. friend Adam Shapiro, who's a wonderful actor in his own right, started a presto company during the pandemic. Everyone should eat it. Um, but his wife is uh, Katie Lowe. She was on Scandal. And mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. all they both work all the time. Yeah. Um, he said it best, actually. I've been, I've been saying it in too many words. And he said it best. He said, if you do not know your character's line, you do not know the character. Yeah. And what I challenge myself and students and other friends to do is, don't memorize the line, figure out why you're saying that and why you're saying that that way. And the example I always use is terrible. If, you, if someone else, if you're listening, if someone else says, I love you more than life itself, your response is probably, I love you too. I'm sorry, I don't love you. Or uh, someone's at the door. You know what I mean? Like it's very, it's one of those things. Mm -hmm. And if you're listening, you find that even bad writing it's obvious what your, your, your lines are. And I used mm -hmm. to have a photographic memory at accidental. I couldn't control it, but I used to have one. And now I'm older and <laughs> I've had experiences and uh, it's terrible now. My memory is trash. And I remember specifically X number of years ago, I was at the gym and I got a like 10 page audition due in four hours. And it was one of them was like a five page monologue. It was to play the lead guy in you on mm -hmm. then lifetime now Netflix. And I was, as soon as I got it, I'm like, Four, are you kidding me? There's no way I'm gonna remember this. And then on the treadmill, I read the sides and I loved them so much without even trying, I was off book in an hour. Mm -hmm. Because I knew the character, I knew why he was saying this and I enjoyed it and had a good time. Yeah. And it's the same reason, and I'm sure you agree, why at the end of a coaching session, you're off book, you are off book. Yeah, After well, cooking no someone for 45 minutes, you're like, I know the other person's lines <laughs> because yes. yeah, it's, it's not because like we have some big secret, really. It's we know the idea to ask, why is the comma there? Why this word? Why? What is yeah. the character trying to say? And if you do that, you can't help but know the lines. And then then it comes down to. Are you what they pictured? You can't control that. Are you right for the role? You can't control that. Literally, all it boils down to once you get rid of the noise is here's my version of the character. Anyway, have a good day. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's really hard. The uh, is this a word arbitrariness that's so arbitrary? Is that a okay. <laughs> of it all, right? Because sure. we base everything on talent. Like if I were the most talented, I would have booked it. Or if my tape was the best, I would have booked it. And I think that is something it's, it's not, I no longer believe that. I know no. we know, we know that it's not based solely on that. And, and you know what? I'm glad you know that. I will be completely honest. I have to be reminded of that. I tell people that mm. I'm a hypocrite as most of us teachers are. 
Um, I and I'm not saying that in a bad way. It's just, we're human, you know. We're not robots. Uh, but I have relearned that so many times, and none of these are are meant to be uh, in any way offensive. But I have heard over years. I was on hold for a huge movie early on in my career for six months. And I thought it was going to, like, my agent was begging me not to leave him. I'm like, I'm not going to. Like, it was that big of a movie. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get it. And I did not know why. For years. And then years later, I met with the casting director of a different, different studio. And they told me, oh, you know why you didn't get that? And it was the stupidest. Good. But it was just like, the, it had nothing to do with me. Nothing mm -hmm. to do with me at all. And then years later, again, I went in for a role, a series regular that I thought I was going to get. And the casting director was a friend of mine, didn't get it. And for six months, I beat myself up like I let him down. Mm -hmm. He's never going to call me in again. What's wrong with me? I'm a teacher and here I am doing bad auditions. And I ran into him at a book signing. And he sat next to me because we're friends. I was like, oh, you're sitting next to me. <laughs> and we watched the entire book signing. And unprompted, he, he leans to me and he's like, you know why you didn't get that job, right? Mm. And I'm like, inside, I'm like, ah! on the outside, I'm like, oh yeah, what, which job? Um, and he said, well, we just thought you were too attractive for the role, which is hilarious for somebody with body dysmorphia. But for six months, I'm thinking I am trash. It has nothing to do with us most of the time. It could be hair color, height, weight. Uh, it could be... It literally could be they cast a friend. Yes, it could be your performance. So what I focus on as an actor and what I actually try to get ongoing students to learn, coachings, you know, there's only so much time, mm -hmm. is your job as an actor is to remove all the other things from the equation. Mm -hmm. Be so good. Be so on top of your game. Know that you did your job. Have recent headshots. Have a good demo reel that's updated have your social media presence going, have everything in place. So if you're not getting auditions, you know it's not you. And if you're not booking work, you know it's not you. Mm -hmm. But I find most actors, we have a tendency to let things lapse and, you know, um, not to quote again, my friend Todd Sashwick, but as he always says, nobody owes you a career. Yeah. And I oh, think Todd. a lot of us actors, we yeah. feel like we are owed a career. I think if you are in maybe in the beginning stages of it, I think as you've gone on and you'd be a little more seasoned, I'll call us. I don't, well, I don't, I don't think like anybody owes me a career. Um, I feel like sometimes we work really hard and some things are stacked against us. Right. Okay. I think that, you know, is what I might, might, might take a, a little bit of, but, you know, just to touch on the hypocrite part, I don't think of it as being hypocritical. I think of it as I look at it as I am a student of my own work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's self-deprecating and humorous. It's I'm not actually. <laughs> uh, no, but you know, absolutely. And and in fact, I wouldn't want to study, and this is not me trying to promote myself or your business necessarily, but uh I look at myself as um in the trenches. And I wouldn't want to study with anyone who isn't. I don't want to study. Yeah. I've taken a class with somebody who hasn't done it for 30 years, and you're like, none of this applies, you know? Yeah. Um been there. And and so even if somebody's not the the most bookingest person it doesn't mean they don't have a lot to teach you and on the flip side just because somebody has famous clients doesn't mean that their thing works it's about what works for you we are artists you should mm -hmm. learn the actor's tool belt you should learn every style you can so that way you pick out what you need when you need it you yeah. should you know people who live uh, elsewhere make fun of la people all the time because they're like all you guys do is talk about tv and film and the industry and for the longest time, I apologized. And then I realized, because we're passionate about it, man. Yeah. Because yeah. we love it. And I'm so proud that we do. And that means learn everything. Never yeah. stop learning. Always be growing. Always challenge yourself. And sadly, the reason I shook my head is not, I didn't believe you. It's, I find actually, there's a bit of a bell curve. With that. I've had a lot of uh, coffee. Forgive me for rambling. There's a, bit <laughs> of a, um, a bell curve where if you're brand new, you're like, you arrive to LA or New York or Chicago or Vancouver and you're like, I'm here, where's my series? <laughs> and it's yeah. just absurd. And then you work for a while and you're just kind of like, I'm so happy to be here. And then a lot of people, if they're not careful, crest it and start to be like, come on, I've been on a series. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And both of these are death knells. Both sides are the end of your career, bad reputation, you're never gonna work and you're just gonna be that bitter actor who's like drunk at residuals with your, the, your one check that you just turned in for a shot yeah. and you're yeah. mad. 
but the ones who work all the time are the ones who best example I can give and forgive me. I hate it when people are like, say to us, like you're name dropping. No, the longer you live in this industry, the more names are recognizable. We just know people. Yeah. 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 If I'm like my friend, Kevin, you're not going to be like name dropper. But if I say yeah. Lou Diamond Phillips told me once, um, or I had this happen and it was amazing. We were filming Stargate. You worked with them. I was like, you can't, yeah. you worked with them. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many people are like name drop. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was so nervous to meet him. Stand and deliver, young guns, La Bamba. I was like, huh. And he was the nicest, funniest dude. And then I saw this first day on set. An AD walks up to him and says, can I get you a water? And Lou Diamond Phillips says, oh, I'm going to go get one myself. Would you like one? Mm. To the AD. And I went, yeah. that's why you've been working forever. You're really good. And you're just happy to be here. And that's what the bell curve edges sort of uh, ruin is mm -hmm. entitlement or waiting for the phone to ring, especially nowadays, or, and I've, I've been guilty of this too, where I'm like, I need to get a new manager or agent. Why aren't my friends referring me? Well, did you ask them? Yeah, you know? Yeah. And, and it's, it's hard. It's a hard thing in any career, but especially the arts, to not know why you're not working. Yeah. And, yeah. and it can hurt. Yeah, it's a big one. You know, one thing that you 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 touched about, I'm gonna ping pong back to like a business element that you kind of like slid by, which <laughs> was and I and I'm like, and I'm like, oh, don't forget that. Was you said I left and went to a bigger agent, and then you said as an aside, big mistake, and then you kept going. What do you mean by why was it a big mistake? Because isn't that what we all want to do is get with the CAAs or I mean, I'll be like you, you think you have to go jump like when I used to help actors find agents or managers that used to be one of the things I did in Think Bigger Coaching. I feel like actors only came to me with 25 people on their list, the same 25 mm -hmm. agents or managers. And I'm like, there are some people out there that are gonna work so much harder for you that are like maybe on your C list that you haven't even thought of. And so I'm like, you're saying, oh, I got with these big people that are definitely on that 25. We don't have to say the name, but like, you know, on that list, what, it was a mistake? Yeah, I mean, look, this is, we're all talking about, just to disclaim, this is my journey and in no way is right. this, is this it's not absolute. Especially while being recorded. In no way am I talking trash <laughs> about anyone. Um, I didn't say the name. I didn't put a name out there. So they don't know. Nobody knows. But well, I mean, Google exists. So yeah. <laughs> but um, but what I what I now look, I you know, we, we hindsight is 2020. And I can look back and realize the mistakes I made. And much like you said, forgive me for clarifying, I find that all actors it's probably true for writers, directors, and producers too, but all actors want is an agent who, one, is passionate about them, yeah. and two, gets their phone calls answered. But what usually happens is one or the other. Mm. A sweet spot is both. Very rare. Very, very rare. Mm. Though you usually have to do one or the other. And we've all been there. A passionate agent who can't get us auditions is like, that's not helping us. And somebody who can get their phone calls answered but isn't passionate is not making the phone call. So it's tough. And my best agent, I would say that I ever had in the past was a boutique agency where one of the agents really believed in me and fought tooth and nail. This, this agent doesn't know it because confidentially, this agent is mad at me because I was uh, advised to leave them at a certain point. So they very much hold it against yeah. me, but they don't know this. I have referred so many people to them and said, just don't use my name mm -hmm. um, because they were, they were fearless and fighting mm -hmm. for me. Most of the work that I got that made my career was with this person. And I switched to a bigger company who law of diminishing returns over a few years, less and less auditions, the less I booked, the less it seemed I got. Um, also, you know, my type was changing. And as I said, I was losing the, the next 40 pounds. I lost 45 in two years on Stargate. And then I lost the other another 40 over a year or two. So I was still kind of between types for a while. And then they convinced me to move to a much bigger agency. So I dropped this person who had been fighting for me. They made mistakes. Don't get me wrong. They weren't perfect, but, but they were fighting for me. And I, and I fought a lot of them, but I was convinced I had to go to this bigger place. <laughs> and it, it, just, it was shiny, you know? And we've all heard the stories of like, don't sign with a big agent too soon. You know, actors who book off of a showcase and they're at CAA and they move here. I literally took a class with a guy, fellow student, who was like, I came here fresh from college and I walk into a room and it's me, Heath Ledger and Josh Hartnett. 
And they're like, and I have no credits. I'm not going to get this. Mm -hmm. And even with that, I was convinced to go to this bigger agency. Like all the agents are in the room. Like we want to like very entourage. We want to be in the Davy Blue brand type situation. And they, I don't think they got me. I don't think they did. And I appreciate the first six months. Woo, it was crazy. 17 pilot auditions in a month. Yeah. Nuts. Yeah. And then nothing for seven months. And then seven really? pilot auditions. And then nothing for seven months. And then three pilot auditions. And then nothing for seven months. And I started going, I can literally feel the iron cooling. Like I can oh. feel my potential fading. And it was, a, it was a tough pill to swallow at the time. You know, hence the diving into motivation and self-worth and exploration mm -hmm. and classes and everything. And what I learned was it doesn't matter. Like you said, it doesn't matter who you're with unless they're right for you. Yeah. And even as much as nowadays, I still question, like literally like yesterday, I'm like, should I reach out to that agency and say, hey, remember me? <laughs> it's impossible to predict what'll work for you. Um, and that's why people like us who are the old guard now, I guess, um, we learn how the industry- Middle guard, <laughs> how can you- <laughs> Yeah, I feel like the old guard though. <laughs> Um, I mentioned something to a student and they're like, I've never even heard of that show. And I'm like, this is not okay. Yeah. Uh, but it, it was a tough lesson and I'm still learning it. You know, where do I belong? I am currently looking for a manager. I haven't had one in a while. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not auditioning very much, to be completely honest. I'm not. I'm doing good work. You know, I'm even asked casting friends, like, do you like what I've turned? They're like, yes, like, you're great. But I'm just m not getting opportunities. And so trying to find a manager right now and talking to my friends who are in the same position, it's tough because you don't want to just chase a logo, but you also don't want to just pick a random person. You want somebody who knows you, believes in you, has connections, and it's really, really hard ever, let alone modern climate, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's so interesting, and I don't think many people want to really, really hear that about what you're saying, your journey, is that... I, I'll put myself in this position. You know, I believed that once I booked insert role, <laughs> insert role, that it was going to be like literally snowfall. People are going to be like signing up. They're going to be like, what's up? Duan? Like it's going to be coming. And I feel like I've had to have that thought or that reset so many times. I had to have it after the MTV movie. I had to have it after the recurring, you know, after, you know, and I'm like, what is happening? And to hear you say, hmm. I'm translating, there's a big ebb and flow in this industry yeah. and if we're not ready for that ebb and flow it can take you out and even more than that if i can piggyback on that please um that's actually where i think a lot of the the actors who don't aren't aware of this self-sabotage you know like for example i auditioned for han solo and solo mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i had just gone through a breakup and i was driving to this audition and literally had this conversation in my head hey did you hear what happened to david no what what happened to my ex-boyfriend he's han solo now what and like I'm driving to the audition and I'm playing this like revenge fantasy in my head. And I'm like, I've, I've lost this job already. Like I'm, like I'm, I'm trying every job when you want to work, every job is like, this is the one. And the truth is the older you get, the more you realize the ones that make your career are not the ones you were expecting. And the ones you think are going to change your life don't. They don't. Um, and usually you can't even predict which ones you're going to get. Stargate's a great example. I was in New York filming Ugly Betty and I got two auditions. I got one for this new ABC space drama and then one for a new Stargate. I had watched all the Stargates before. So I was like, that's awesome, but I'm really curious about this ABC drama. And I fought hard to do it. And I went to the audition and it didn't feel good in the room. I was like, I'm not gonna get this. So then I went to the Stargate one, which I booked and did for two years. The ABC show was canceled after like four episodes. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even the one I thought I wanted, and it was the one that made everything. And much like you said, Ugly Betty is a great example for that. My agent at the time could not get me into this one casting office. No matter how hard they tried, they're like, we're trying, they just will not respond. My first episode of Ugly Betty aired, and I had a meeting with them the next day. Mm -hmm. And I learned very hard <laughs> that it does matter yep. what you're doing, and what, but, but you can't control it. Your job as an artist is to show up and do your job. And I think that's one of the hardest lessons that and you don't know, you know, mm -hmm. like you don't know I was lucky and then I was gaining weight for Ugly Betty in a time where heavyset leads were becoming popular. 
all of a sudden for the first time. And so I was able to like, boom, hop in there. Um, the ebbs and flows of the industry of what's popular of, of kinds of things they're making of the, the people they're looking for of social media chasing of whatever name chasing it, it you can't control any of that and you're never going to survive or be mentally stable if that's where your focus is mm -hmm. your yeah. focus is your work and i think that's the tough lesson so, I mean, one of the things you, you, you said right there was our job. And I think our job has changed over the pandemic a little, a lot of it. I want to say a little bit, but a lot of it. And so uh, how do you, DB, how do you step into and prepare for your self-tapes? Um, you mean like the process of the acting side of it or the process of taping? Ah, the acting side of it, right? Because okay. that's what I think, you know, I'm, I want to get out there to actors. Like I, the, the technical stuff we can learn in like five minutes. Um, and then also, you know, all of us do tape yeah. and stuff. And I mean, mm -hmm. let, look, let me, let me speak to you actors out there straight up, all of you. Hello, hello, little actors. I love you. Um, first off, <laughs> you got to see this on YouTube, you all. You got to see his first. <laughs> Go for it. Let me just, like, self-tapes suck. We suck. Mm -hmm. It's not our job. It's not our job to light or edit, or or find a reader, or uh, you know, pick a tape. That's not mm -hmm. our job. And and in fact, when you do it well and you book the job, you're not going to show up to set and they're like, "We loved your tape. Can you adjust this light?" Mm -hmm. You're not going to do that. So is it fair? No. Accept it. Move on. Um, you know, a lot of being an actor is I don't like this. What am I going to do about it? You know. Um, that being said, and I used to be that person who's like, I only book in the room. Don't make me self tape before the pandemic. And now I'm like booking off of tapes. My clients are booking off of tapes. And I think a lot of it is kind of, uh, can I speak about, are you can't go a few minutes over? Cause I don't want to talk. Yeah, dude, let's do it. <laughs> uh, Cause I've actually had this conversation. A friend of mine's a bigger casting director and they told me, and this is terrifying. They told me without dropping their name that their office hated self tapes. They're like, we don't like, mm -hmm. we don't want to do, ever do self tapes. And then the pandemic happened and they started going, they literally said to me, we just realized how amazing it is. And I think we're just going to stick with them now. And I couldn't help myself. I don't know what it is about me, but I, I'm like very like Superman, black and white. I have to stick up for the little guy. And I said, can I, can I be honest with you? That's terrible. Because mm -hmm. let, me, let me tell you from a producing standpoint, why I wish you didn't say that. Do you understand that when you hire somebody off of a tape, you don't know if that took one take or a thousand and you're now bringing them to set and you might waste an entire day. And I've been there, waste an entire day trying to get them where they were on the tape because you didn't know how long it took. Um, and, and on the other side too, and actors hire someone please for your tape because a bad reader, uh, bad lighting, bad editing, bad sound, all these things could cost you a job. Whereas, I think we can all admit with a, with an actual in-person audition, whatever those are, you go, you do it once and you leave. You don't have to worry about anything but your performance. And I would even say psychologically, if you mess up once in a pre-read in person, the casting people will go, they were great other than that one thing, but I think we can fix that. Let's bring them back. Whereas with a self tape, we're expected to be perfect because we had as many takes as possible. The truth is, no, we didn't. We had as much time to prepare the pre-read as we did the self-tape. But we're expected to be off book, no sides in hand, perfect, flawless. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's way more pressure than actors need, and it's more on our mind. That being said, putting all that aside, tangent, go away. Um, I think our job for a self-tape or in the room is the same. And it's, a, it's funny that you asked me now and that we scheduled it like we did. This month in my ongoing class, rather than like give them a new scene every week. I am, we're doing the same scene and week one is step one. We just got the audition, what are we gonna do? And I think it's, stop, don't jump into memorizing. It's read it once, just so you kind of read everything, crossed out the whole script if they give it to you, if you're lucky to be with that size agency. Um, and then start writing down your thoughts on the character based on fact, so you don't go down the wrong road. You know, don't be like, I think because my mom beat me one. Unless the script says it, do not write it down. Then once you have a very clear idea who this character is, um, we're skipping a lot of steps, but who this character is, where they come from, why they are the way they are, then you start looking at the dialogue. And you think to yourself, 
why am I saying this? Forgive me for using Shakespeare as an example, but one of my favorite monologues, your grace shall pardon me, I will not back. Um, first of all, no one talks about S- Subtle flex, subtle flex. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you know what's funny is I find Shakespeare, not to, no offense, Stan, John, or Leslie, um, I find Shakespeare to be the best example of why thoughts matter. Because much ado about nothing. Oh, she misused me past the endurance of a block. Most people would go, what? What did you just say? And if you go, what am I saying there? Oh, she just misused me past the endurance of a block. Oh, she just misused me. Oh, she just fucked with me more than an inanimate object would have taken. And if you take that performance, oh, she just fucked with me more than an inanimate object would have taken and replace the dialogue. Oh, she misused me past the endurance of a block. Now you know exactly what you're saying, but you have to know what you're saying. So I find that for me, the very important next step that if I ever skip, I sit there for a day and I'm like, why don't I know the lines? And then I realize it's because I skipped this step is what am I saying and why am I saying it that way? Your grace shall pardon me. I will not back your grace. That's kind of bowing your head like, I respect you. I honor you. I will not back is, but I'm not going to take your order. Your grace shall pardon me. I will not back. And it's if you know that, dialogue's in your head, you know the choice. And you're not even stuck in a line reading. You understand the character. So you don't end up in that horrible sort of unfortunate trap that actors find themselves in where if somebody gives you a note, you're so locked into your performance that you just throw everything away and suddenly it's just you. You know what I mean? Like, you're like, I built a character. I built a character. What if he's not angry? Okay, it's just me. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. And instead, you're taking it and you're processing it. And, and forgive, it's the theater part of me. Like, I think you have to understand the character. And yes, actors, I understand that it's frustrating that it's just an audition. Yes, if you're playing the role on Broadway for four months, you can commit the time to know a person. But I would challenge that if you want to play this role, you should know them better than anyone. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, you know, everybody's trying to figure out how to get that quickly, right? Because there is a turnaround time that we're doing with self tapes and- Oh, do you want my condensed version? (laughs) No, 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 no. I don't like, you know, like, like you said, but listen, one of the things I work on and I'm very specific with, and you know, I do a program called self tapes at book is just giving you a quick workflow. I think people just forget steps. Like they're like, what do I do from, Oh, let me schedule to work with David. Let me schedule to work with Dewan. Like just give you a workflow of that. And I don't believe, I really don't. I don't believe that you should start um, on your lines. That's like step number five. Yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? That really is step number five. But what we do is we try to truncate it and go to that step first because we're putting, you know, um, all the other stuff, but we think we're going to go back to now. I need to know the relationship. Now I need to know why am I saying that? But what we do is we skip to it and then we start making it our own. And I think you You know, know, it, well, and again, just this, I know I don't need to, but I can't help but be, I always have imposter syndrome. I suffer from depression, anxiety, body dysmorphia, and, and all that stuff. So I'm going to disclaim, I promise audience members and you as well, I'm not, this isn't like competing acting coaches. I'm not like trying to get business or you're trying to get business. Like, I'm not like, let me tell you about my process, you know, but that being no, said, no I need find, to say that. <laughs> no, I say that. So my website, no, uh, mm. but, but I do find a lot of, a lot of actors, and, and I lump myself into that, don't understand what casting is. What do and, you mean by that? Well, if anyone's ever cast or produced, which I'd highly recommend, uh, you learn a lot. Watch auditions, because whoo, you learn a lot. Um, what a casting director wants, everyone's already heard that saying that no one believes, it's true, that casting wants you to be the best. Casting yeah. is hoping you're the best. But I'll mm-hmm. even take that further. The ideal situation is producers, studio, network, and casting are sitting here watching person after person come in and try hard. And they want to watch somebody come in and go, yes, just light that and we're good. They don't want to have to do anything. They want you to come in and know the character the best, have made strong choices, but also be like, that's even more than we expected. That's even more than I read. That's exactly what I was thinking and more. And they want to not even have to deal with anything beyond that. Right. But in order to do that, it's not, let's even put aside know the character better than anyone. It's know what you're doing. Um, if you just memorize lines, and we've all been there, you have this moment where you hit a speed bump, but you like say one word wrong or you trip a little, and all of a sudden you either forget everything after, like a Jenga tower that fell, 
or you find yourself out of your body and you're still talking and you're like, who's controlling my body right now? And you're just like, blah, 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 blah. And you're like, this can't be good, <laughs> you know? And in order to avoid that, I find it's really important to, to grab onto your scene partner. So to truncate things, and I, I'm no, I'm, I don't think that I'm undercutting my own ability as a coach and as a teacher. <laughs> I teach more than this, but uh, <laughs> truncate things. I think it's important to number one, read everything, mm -hmm. everything you get. And I mean everything, like the breakdown they sent you, the email they sent you, uh, the sides, the crossed out parts, the full script, if you got it. Then take everything physical out of the breakdown. Cross it out. You, you cannot, if it says attractive, cross it out. You're, you're, someone thought you were attractive. Stop even thinking about that word. If it says, you know, the last pilot I tested for was to play a 22-year-old woman. So like, cross everything out. Um, and then questions are my favorite thing in the world. I throw as many questions at things as I can. And I'm not talking, and most people only do who, what, when, where, how, and why. Not where are we? Why are we at, like an example I use is funny enough from the ABC pilot that I went in for. It's, it's the first scene I give any new student. It takes place in a bar, it just says interior bar night. Why are we in this bar? Is it a big bar? Is it like a giant ballroom? Or is it a tiny, sticky floor, dank bar? Am I in the corner next to the bathroom? Am I sitting at the bar? How many people are there? Are they way over there on that side? Or are they like bumping up next to me? Those things change your performance from, hey, to, hey, entirely different. And the more you nerd, the more you fill in the holodeck, <laughs> the more you- I'm like, checking. <laughs> The easier it is for, you might not use everything, but it's just stimuli for you to act off of. We've all done theater. When you're on a stage and it's fully built and everyone's in costume, it's, it's hard not to be in character. Mm -hmm. Build that for yourself. And I'm not saying to go crazy with it and have props and, and costumes. I'm just saying do as much work as you can. So what, what I find is if you put in the effort, and especially if you've written and you can look into scripts and understand why they wrote it that way, you find out that there's a blueprint. 95% of what the role is, is just right there given to you. Yeah. And then there's about 5%, which sounds like not a lot, but it's quite a bit. There's 5% for you to bring your own flavor to and, and, and color and whatever. But I find most actors try to expand the five and ignore the other part. And all you're doing is shooting yourself in the foot. You're, you're making choices that is a huge risk. You're, you're challenging things when in fact you might've been perfect for the role. Um, and, and I find that they're focused on the wrong, uh, we are focused on the wrong thing. Now I do have to disclaim though with one wonderful story and then I'll shut up. Um, <laughs> I mean, I could, I, for what it's worth, I know I said I have that thing, I have time, but I don't wanna keep you too long. Um, I had a friend who, a, a client and a friend who came in for an audition for a role. And the role was defensive. Um, on paper, the role was grill, chains, like, and, and my friend walked in with that energy of, ugh. And, I, and we read it once and I said, are you, are you okay? And he's like, <laughs> no. He's like, I don't wanna do these types of roles on TV. I really don't, I don't like perpetuating it. And I told him what I truly believe. I said, you have two paths in front of you. Now, my job as a coach and as a teacher is not to make you do the performance I want you to do. Right. It's to help craft your performance to be the best it can be and correct. You know, I'll tell you if I think you're doing something wrong, but it's your choice whether you want to do it. And so I said, you have two paths in front of you. You play what's written. You play this stereotypical, clearly written by an old white dude, uh, gangster fucking role. Mm -hmm. Or we find a version of it that you are comfortable playing. And it's a bigger risk, because it's not what's on paper. It's still gonna match, but it's not what's obvious. But you're happier with it, and you can sleep at night. And he's like, can we please? And we did. And he recurs as that character now. And mm. now that's a, that's a good story. I mean, he might have not booked it, but I think a lot of ours, whether or not it's that exact situation, our job as an artist, is to show how we see things. So that means make choices, know how you see things, and put in the time. Yeah.
Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I believe again, that we really must bring ourselves and our, 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 our point of view to a role like that. You know, I went in for a lot of those roles and I talk about it often that I can't, I didn't want to play that version of the thug, but I could play my essence, my version of it. And this is what I'm going to give you and be comfortable with it. And if I didn't book it, it's okay, because I was comfortable with that. I think we're missing a little bit of that. And I can't say everybody out there listening. I don't want you all to fall. If you don't fall in this category, don't. But I think we're missing when we hear the thought of bring you to the role. You're, we hear that and we think the casting directors are being lazy by saying, oh, I don't see you in the role. Like do something with you. And what I believe is it's because everybody's following the A plus B equals C, the, the black stuff on the paper. Instead of let me see what David, David, like I, you, 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 you've talked about depression and you've talked about like, you know, body dysmorphia, like that stuff does it does different stuff to your mind that doesn't that I don't I don't have that angle not angle that's not the word I want to use that that background with. yeah no you're right you know I mean? to to fly back uh that's actually part of the problem that happened when I lost the weight I'm I lost the weight nine ten years ago Ugh. uh time um <laughs> I lost the weight nine ten years ago and the funny thing is I still get auditions all the time to play the fat guy and then there, or I get auditions and I, they're surprised to see that I'm not still heavy. And I'm like, I lost weight 10 years ago. And yeah. it's, we're branded. We are the brand. We are mm -hmm. the CEO, CFO. We are the ad exec and the product all at the same time. And a lot of that is what I bring to something. My role, my, you know, how do I say this? I, I hope, again, those of you who are listening to this who do not know me or my career or have never heard an interview with me before, please understand that I, I really have like zero self-confidence um <laughs> i lost enough weight where in the same day not anymore i don't audition anymore but when i was auditioning i would have fat nerd at nine o'clock in the morning and at noon hot guy who beats up the nerd mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i'm like which one am i the industry doesn't even know how am i supposed to know and when i walk into a room to play like the romantic lead of a thing i feel like three squirrels in a trench coat like i'm just yeah. like putting it on but at the same time when i'm auditioning for the funny friend who's fat telling a knock knock joke in the corner while the two leads are getting it on that doesn't feel right either and what i had to learn is what is my version of this and what makes sense for me and i find mm -hmm. this whole self-tape thing which is not going anywhere everyone like set up your process um it's putting more of the impetus on the actor, which I think is a good thing, but it's dangerous because we refuse to take any of it, as we have for years. I have friends who have lived in LA for 20 years who have never gotten new headshots. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. you can live in LA and be like, I'm an actor and never take a class. You know, you, you have to do the work. Earn 90% of the money. Earn 90, 99% uh, better than the other people in the union. And that means time and effort and energy. And, and also, like you said, focusing on the right things. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> there's this stereotype that I always joke about because I'm it too. Every actor in the world. I'm not auditioning. I'm not auditioning. Why am I not getting auditions? Give me some auditions. Ring, ring. Ugh, not today. <laughs> no. It, it's who we are. Moments notice. I've missed out on vacations because I wanted to be available for jobs. Um, and forgive me for going back, but I wanted to say this when you were talking about um, one of our other tangents. Uh, when I was on a series, like I'm a series regular for the first time ever, surrounded mm -hmm. by heavyweights like Robert Carlyle, Lou Diamond Phillips, Ming Na, mm -hmm. um, huge guest stars like Christopher McDonald and stuff, and feeling a little bit like I don't belong, but you know, I did my job. And all I wanted to do was work more. And I'm bothering my agents and managers. Like, can we, like, fringe shoots across the street? I love that show. Can I audition? No. You have a visa to work in Canada on this one show. You're not allowed to audition for any of these other shows. Can I audition for any LA stuff? No, because back then, self-tapes weren't really a thing. They weren't, yeah. So for two years, I wasn't even allowed to do anything else. And that's hard, even though I loved what I was doing. But you know what really impressed me? Some of my castmates, who I think very highly of, we're still taking acting classes on weekends. Mm -hmm. They were working 60 hour weeks and then learning a play for an acting class for Saturday. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, 
acting is this is a dangerous slope acting is who we are it shouldn't be all we are you know you have to have life why is it dangerous friend because i've been there and it, it's very easy for that to be your entire self you know mm -hmm. and then when you're not working you feel dead you feel like you have nothing and that sucks um you have to have a full life but it's who we are it's what we want to do i mean you know my friend i don't even know who we have in common anymore but i'm assuming everyone harvey mm -hmm. harvey Gian, mm -hmm. um great dude he's on what we do in the shadows they just announced he's playing nightwing on oh, harvey harvey yeah. oh, this is harvey yes 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 yeah. mm -hmm. um he is currently either a series regular or recurring on five things right now. Yeah, yeah. And, and I love a response he did to somebody yesterday. Somebody was like, wow, look at you killing it all of a sudden. And he responded, I was always killing it. It's just more higher profile now. Mm -hmm. And it's this, people think you're an overnight success. They don't see the 30 years of work you did to get there. And even talking about, you know, the two and a half years I rose from co-star to recurring to series regular, it's ignoring the year I did non-union background work to learn how a set worked, the year I interned at a commercial agency to see how commercial casting works, the number of casting workshops I did to start making friends, um, the networking I would do with friends, not to, man there's a huge difference between manipulation and networking, but it's a thin line. Um, the writing, producing, classes, all of that. Because what ends up happening is, and I think you've had this too, when you start working, all your friends go, I always knew you'd make it. And you're like, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> but you, you have to put in all, you have to earn it. And I think that's the biggest lesson that actors don't want to hear. Earn it. The best compliments I've ever heard other people get or myself got. Ugly Betty. I was the least known person in that room. And I fought. And when I booked it, without even prompting, the casting said, you earned this. My friend who I just talked about, who did the less stereotypical role, when he showed up on set, the lead of the show said, we didn't even see it that way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's our job. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I think as we land this plane, I want to just say like, you know, in the realm of mindset like you know you've done so much you've been so many places you know i've been watching from afar now because of the pandemic you know where you get to see your yourself in um i want to say Times square like the the billboard <laughs> like what do they call those things in the sky we're well, not you know like the things but that like is you how know. old we are now <laughs> like what is that <laughs> word <laughs> what is that word <laughs> You know, like where, where the industry has shown a lot of up, ups and downs and what's your staying power? I mean, before you answer that, David, I know you're going to go to some place a little bit self-deprecating, but I also, yeah, I also know that, you know, behind that self-deprecation that you love this industry and you love what you do. And I wouldn't have asked you to be on the podcast if I didn't believe that. So I before you go there, I want to say like, seriously, like what is your mindset from that, from that first series regular from the downs to the ups to now where you're at because you are sustaining a career man you really really are you know the ironic thing um and this isn't self-deprecation which yeah <laughs> i'm very very good at he couldn't resist y'all no resist no it. no i wanted i want to just claim that it's not okay, because, okay so during the pandemic i've i've like you i've hosted a lot i've had a lot of podcasts and we were talking about this before i started this thing where every saturday i have a celebrity guest on and i was just my, even my idea for the podcast back in the day was I want people to hear the conversations you have over a drink with a friend at a bar instead of the ones you hear in an interview, because mm -hmm. you, it's always the same sound bites, you know, and I wanted I wanted to hear like a funny story that Lou Diamond told me once about a thing that happened on set or, you know, whatever. And the funny, the weird thing is in doing this through the pandemic, I got to see a lot of huge actor, writer, director, producers, musicians and find out how not alone we all are in our current mentality. And it's so helpful, and it's part of the reason I even do things like these, in addition to hanging out with friends, um, and even teach, and I tell every student I can everything I learned. And part of that is, you hear when you're starting out that there is no such thing as job security in acting. There's no such thing as success, really. You know, uh, yeah, I graduated with, Two BFA is acting in musical theater. I've never walked into an audition. They're like, two BFA, you know what? The job's yours. You know, I have to do the work every time. Yeah. 
And part of that is whether you have these sparse years where you don't work for a bit, whether you reinvent yourself and kind of have to start over, whether you just got off a series. I just had a friend, I asked him to be on my show and he's like, I can't do any press for two years. And I'm like, what? He's like, I have to disappear for a little while so that the industry will see me as something else. Wow. And yeah. the funny thing is across the board, now speaking about myself, it's just that others say the same thing. I don't feel like I've had a sustaining career. I don't feel like I've worked a lot. And that's not self-deprecating. Yeah. Sometimes I look at my resume and I go, oh shit, I really have worked, haven't I? Sometimes I'll get an email from a fan. And they're like, it's good to see you never stopped working. And I'm like, <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, because as an actor, if we're being honest, every job feels like your could be your last. Mm. And you never know what's next unless the stars align. Um, and so I have oftentimes, I'm not even denying that I might be going through it now. I have oftentimes struggled with, is there more? Am I ever going to work again? Uh, and what it came down to for me, you'll forgive another story. <laughs> um, you sure you got time? I do. Okay. Um, so Aisha Tyler told me on my podcast once, and this has haunted me ever since. She said, there's three types of actors in LA. The ones who will never work, the ones who work once and then disappear, and the ones who work forever. And there's nothing in between. And while she was saying it, I think I pooped myself. <laughs> I was like, oh God, I'm the second one. You know what I mean? Like I immediately, I was like, oh, I should quit. And a lot of times, if you're not aware, it can feel like the industry is screaming at you. We don't want you. You know, I mean, honestly, until what, yesterday? That's how a lot of diversity <laughs> mm -hmm. people felt like, and, 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 and ugh. Um, mm -hmm. it can really, really be tough. And I had this really interesting moment. I don't know if you know this. Uh, my apartment was destroyed like seven years ago. Mm -hmm. So I was struggling a little bit. I, my friend and I decided to uh, get a place together, get, you know, be, get a roommate for the first time in years. And um, he was a studio exec. And our upstairs neighbor set his apartment on fire. Uh, and we evacuated thinking it was a false alarm and the water from the sprinklers came through our ceiling and destroyed everything I owned. And he, everything was just gone. And I found myself living in a hotel waiting for renter's insurance to kick in, not working, worried about money because I had nothing. I had a t-shirt and my laptop. That's it. And I was like, what, what am I doing? I've never really had this thought. I'm like, what am I doing with my life? I'm not having any auditions right now. I haven't actually been on set in like a year. Uh, do I even still enjoy this? I don't know. And I had an audition the next day and I didn't even want to go. I had one shirt. <laughs> I didn't want to go to this audition. I remember sitting parked outside of Raleigh Studios and I'm like, don't even go in, this is stupid. And I went in and I booked it. And I did a movie in Portland for three weeks where they put me up in a hotel when I needed a place to live. Thank God. <laughs> and right? and uh, I walked onto set thinking like, do I even still enjoy this? And within two minutes, I went, fuck. Yep, this still makes me happier than anything. Mm -hmm. And it was a really telling moment for me. And I needed it. And I'm glad it happened. Which is, it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. It doesn't matter if someone thinks you're a failure or a success. In the same day, one casting director is going to think you're the worst actor in the world, and the next one's going to think you're Oscar worthy. It doesn't matter how long your resume is. What matters is what you do in the room. Every time. I booked Ugly Betty because I fought for it. I was the only overweight one for Stargate. Uh, I had never been a series regular before for that. Um, I can't tell you the number of times I was the outlier, you know, um, and I booked it. And realizing how important it was to me and realizing that no matter how long I go without working, all it takes is one other job, yeah. you know, um, kind of helped in a weird way. And it helped me bring me to the mindset that I try to hold on to now. And I'm not going to lie, I struggle with it. But the mindset of do your job. I got hired, you know, I've been recurring on a kid's show and they hired me to do a TikTok promo that was like an eight page monologue to camera. And at the end of it, the lead of the show, who's become a friend, I didn't even know he was still there. He's like, hey, thank you for putting so much effort into this silly little TikTok promo. And without missing a beat, I just was like, that's my job. That's what you hired me for. 
And I very much appreciate and accept the compliment you gave that I've sustained. It does not feel like that. And in fact, in this moment right now, as I'm trying to find a manager and I can't, the little voice inside of me is like, maybe you're done. Maybe that was it. Yeah, I want to be clear, though. Let's be clear. Let's be clear that, and this just may be me saying this to you. It's not that you can't find a manager, David, because there's managers out there that want. Oh, yeah. Right? Like, and I want to be clear, everybody listening to it. It's not like nobody wants you, no, right? No, 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 no. It's at all. like you're looking for something specific, to be clear, right? Well, like, or, or like, a, like, a, like, because a, there's somebody that wants you. We can go find you ABC management that's like, oh, I'll take David. But you're like, that's not where I want to go anymore, right? Well, to, okay. Well, first of all, <laughs> no, 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 no. First of all, no, but to put a point on it, I do want to just make sure I say thank you for saying. Sometimes I think we in the industry, no matter how successful or unsuccessful you are, cannot see the forest for the trees. Mm -hmm. So having a friend, let alone a contemporary, let alone somebody that you respect and think they're doing good work, you thank say you. you have a sustaining career and you're even remotely good or anything like that. It, thank you. You know, like uh, that feeds. The I believe that, by the way, I'm not just I, it. I believe it, but I also I understand know. there's down. But, you know, I understand that, like, from this side, you're saying if we work guys two weeks out of 52 weeks, you know, like it can look spaced out or a month out of the other 11 months, it can look spaced out. I get it because we're in the industry. But 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 DB, I think you've been like, you know. Okay, I, I, no, I I'm, I'm actually literally saying I appreciate it. It feeds the little scared child inside of me who's like, oh, I didn't know that. Like, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, and funny what you just said. I have a friend who's currently a regular on a huge show, but they won't they won't announce it for two years. So he just told me the other day. He's like, it's not getting me any auditions because no one can talk about it. Like, that's how weird our industry is. But the manager thing, because I believe in complete transparency. Look, everyone who's listening. <laughs> so I don't shoot my income in the foot. I am a good coach, I'm a good teacher, I know what I'm talking about and I advise people very well. Doesn't mean anything because when it comes to your own career, and this is not a bad thing, I am not a popular category right now, mm -hmm. as I shouldn't be. Yay, there is a push for people who are not me and that's good, yay. But because of that, no, actually uh, most, People don't even want to take meetings. It doesn't matter how many credits you have. We, we exist in an industry, and the sooner you all accept this, the easier your sanity is going to be. We exist in a career where it doesn't matter what you've done, it's what have you done lately. Yeah. Uh, so that whole iron is hot thing, which sucks, but it's true, plus not being a popular category, plus I'm getting older, you know, even though I look 12. You look great. You look great. You look great. <laughs> um, so I, a lot of managers and, and here's, can I be educational to, to everyone listening? And, and maybe even, I mean, you might've already seen this on a, when I posted it. Um, I got two responses of all of the referrals of all of the cold emails I've sent out, whatever. I got two responses and I think they kind of illustrate where the industry is right now. I don't know how accurate either are, either is, either is, but, um, but I think they illustrate it. The first manager I emailed, and it was a very small, like few sentences with a link to my material. Right. Sent, and this is the entirety of the reply, five minutes later. My plate is more than full. Response number one. <laughs> That's a good start. That hurt. But I was like, I appreciate that you replied, but oof, would, have probably, yeah. would have probably preferred nothing. Um, and then this one kind of rocked me a bit. And I reached out to casting friends, producer friends, and I was like, and other actor friends. And I was like, is this your experience? I, I, I'm not complaining. This isn't me going, Meh. this is me saying, I want to know if everyone agrees with this. And again, I, I appreciate their response. Again, if you're not watching, he's reading this. Go ahead. I'm reading this. And I want to just clarify, I'm saying this, bouncing off of what you just said about a sustained career, all the nice compliments. Due to the pandemic, the casting process is a mess of self-tapes and no one is getting in front of casting directors live, causing booking ratios to plummet and drive our search for more credited names in order to compete and not have to actually self-tape with the masses. Therefore, we're not signing new talent. Yeah. And a lot of that was like, ah, like, first of all, I think that's every actor's fear. Plus more credited. <laughs> like, I, I literally yeah. loaded up my IMDb. I'm like, I swear I've worked. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and the true answer is, 
And I think this is the education for a lot of actors out there and to, to spin it positively as we should. Either this person didn't look at my material and didn't realize I had any credits and this was a stock email they copied and pasted, which might very well be the case, but we don't know. Mm -hmm. like, a, like a scene, we're breaking it down. Right, right, right. On the other side, it's so true that agents, managers, casting, producers, don't understand why things are the way it are, they are. And they're trying to figure it out too. Yeah. The system is broken. And I think it's part of the reason I want all of my friends who are wonderful producers and, and junior studio execs to rise up the ranks. We need a new system. Yeah. And the only way to change the industry is from the inside. It's currently broken. No, all you actors out there who are listening to this, who are mad you can't get auditions, you're not alone. <laughs> um, don't quit if it's what you want to do. If it's not what you want to do, quit now. Go open a pizza place. Get out of here. But it, it'll make it easier to drive to the beach. Um, but if it is what you want to do, it's, it's weird. And no one knows what's going on and no one knows how to fix it. So all you can control is your little bubble. Yeah. It means write, produce, take as many classes as you can, do workshops, get together with friends and do play readings, work on your craft. So if you're not auditioning, if you're not booking, it's not because of you. Yeah. And that's what it's, I do. That's my advice for myself is it doesn't matter if I'm not popular category right now. I know I do good work. It doesn't matter if I don't think I've ever worked. Some people do. And it's really interesting. And I, I'm wondering if you're in the position, if I may ask you a question. Yeah. I find that I go in for the lead of a show or nothing. Like I will audition, I, I went in for, I went to producers to play the lead, one of the leads on Magicians and then I never auditioned for it again. I went to producers to play one of the leads on Flash, never auditioned for it again. And one other show that I always think of, um, it is weird. And I think it's because our type, and may I lump myself into your very attractive category. Um, I, I think people look at us as one of the leads of the show and, and then beyond that, they don't even look at the submission. And it's weird. I think it's very, um, you know, definitely with my agency jump, you know, right before the pandemic, if we're being transparent on that, you know, coming off of Bosch, that the majority of the things I have been auditioning for at least one through five on the call sheet, you know what I mean? But lead leads of things. And I'm just like, but Morris Chestnut is like, <laughs> like, you know, so certain people are auditioning with that. And yes, and then I don't go back in. Um, and I just, it's, it's, it's a mind fuck, but it's also a, let's just remember where we're at. Let's just remember that we were also dreaming to be here a little bit, you know, and now we're here with that. I think the, the, the David, if I, I, mean, I just, like, I just shortened your name, but I, we're friends, so I can do that. But I think one of the things that I, might add to what you said is I think a lot of us are operating with black and white headshots hmm. for operating with the mentality of black and white headshots and right now we're in full digital not even just color we're in digital now um with where our headshots are this is a metaphor but, but what what I mean by that is first of all I hate the 10,000 hours, what all the acting teachers that was like, they're like, you need to put 10,000 hours into your acting only, or you're not an actor. First of all, nobody's keeping score. Where, where's your, where is your <laughs> show me? Did you do five yeah. today? Nobody's doing that, but we're like, I got to do it this way. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't believe in that. And I also believe that that actor or that actor coach that said teacher, whatever said that if you could think of doing anything else, do it. I think that automatically breeds us to be, we're feeling empty if we go out to do other things in our craft. If, if there, you know, I have another um, guest on, there are other people that are musicians. They're, that's still artistry. They're directors. That's still artistry. They're writers. But we have been ingrained to think if I step outside of acting, then I'm not doing this right. That's on and me. I, I, let me clarify. That's on me. I, I said that incorrectly. I mm -hmm. agree with everything you just said. What I, what I meant was I have had so many friends who moved to LA to be an actor mm -hmm. and they didn't take classes and they didn't get headshots yeah. and they spent 10, 15 years here waiting tables and calling themselves an actor and every once in a while submitting to something on Actors Access 
And then 15 years later, they're like, I miss my family back east. I want to see my nephews. And they move back east and they just yeah. wasted 15 years of their life. Yeah, I yeah. mean that. It's not, are there, uh, dude, I'm a musician. I'm a singer. I'm a dancer. I'm a writer. I love my dog. Like, I Wait, you dance? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> used to be a competitive swing dancer, tap, all this stuff. What? Um, Learn something new. Right? I mean, there's, I mean, there's so many things. I started Twitch streaming, hosting, all that stuff makes me happy. Acting, unfortunately, makes me the happiest. I know this about myself. But I'm not saying in any way to not pursue other things. I mean, the more stuff you pursue, the better, you, the better hireable you are and also the better person you are. I'm just saying, you know, here's the metaphor that I use. It's like dating, says the single guy. It's like dating. Um, you can't wake up every morning and look at the person you're with and go, Do I want to be with you today? Because that's a horrible relationship. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a really healthy thing once or twice a year to go, am I happy? Yes, absolutely. And that's do I still want to do this? About. Yeah, and that's yes. what I'm talking about. I'm yeah. talking about the self-check-in and awareness to go, Am I happy? Because what I learned when the apartment was destroyed and I was on set, what I relearned when I just went back during the pandemic to do the a recurring guest star villain on, on Danger Force was even if I get a 10 page monologue that I have to learn by tomorrow while figuring out who's going to walk my dog that I just got because I didn't expect to be on set anytime soon and I'm stressing out, that makes me happier and comfortably working in an office from nine to five. And that's me personally. Mm -hmm. So I pursue it. But that also means, and I remind myself this often, turn it. Turn off the most recent episode of The Flash and work on your audition. Maybe don't drink the entire bottle of wine and instead research managers you could be submitting to. I don't Maybe. appreciate you looking at me when you say that. <laughs> well, I drank the good. You know, also, honestly, and, and this is, I say this, you have to understand, I am a pretty open, honest, transparent person. Obviously. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. And it's terrifying to do this in a, on a recording. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I'm going to do it in the hopes that it helps someone else. I did the same thing with my weight loss journey, and I got a lot of shit for it. But I also had five friends tell me they lost weight because of it, and it was worth it then. So let me tell this is me speaking directly to any actor, whether you're brand new or you're in the same position or whatever. Um, you're not weak for asking for help. And that's true about coaching, taping, um, classes, advice. In the past week, I'm at this point where I am trying to figure out if I need to make changes in my career because I'm not auditioning. It's, you know, I, I'll, I'll be honest. I've had maybe four or five auditions in the past like year and a half. Uh, and that's not great. Not talking voiceover. Voiceover is a whole other world. But um, and I, I just wonder what I need to do. So in the past week, I have uh, called a casting friend of mine, two name actor friends of mine, and uh, a, a, a teacher friend of mine for advice. And every single time I'm about to do it, I feel like they're going to say, oh, David, I don't have time for this. Or Never the case. If you've, if you've done a good job of befriending the people along the way and helping them when they need it and being a positive person and trying your best, everyone here is trying to help you. And what I found out over and over and over again is everyone's freaking out. No one knows what's going on. Just keep doing your job if it's what you want to do. And just keep swimming. <laughs> you know? You give good talk, David. <laughs> you give really, really, really good talk. And, you know, I am, I am, I feel fortunate to be able to call you friend yeah. and to, to really have your number in my phone and to go back and forth. So we are friends. And, you know, um, I would be remiss in just saying this as we sign off that I see you, man. I see you. And I, I hear you. And, you know, the, the friend in me just says that I do think you're doing a great job and all that. But more importantly, I hear what you're saying. Instead of me trying to come back, you're great, great, great. I just hear you. I hear Thank you. you. And you. for what it's worth, ditto uh, up and down and and it's funny real fast it's really funny um talking about you know you saw me go to series regular like the game of leapfrog is so hilariously real i reconnected <laughs> with a friend recently who's killing it and I, d I found out that they were mad at me for 10 years now and i was like are you okay and they're like well this one thing always bothered me and 
the truth is we all have our time. It's not, you don't have one shot. If this is what you want to do for a living, keep at it, support each other, like we're doing right now, be there for each other in the low parts, and be honest with yourself and do the hard work. And you do that, man. Like I have been watching you kill it for a while now. And I love supporting my friends who I think deserve it. And you're a hundred percent in that camp. I appreciate that, man. We're not going to keep going because I, when I, what you were just about to say, I was like, but you know what, coming off of a show, I feel like it's over. <laughs> we'll stop. We'll stop there. And that's Guys. funny, but no, that's actually the exact point that I want new actors to know and old actors to know. Yeah. Every audition feels like it's going to be the last <laughs> one. Every job feels like it's going to be the last one. Every opportunity. But here's where you have to fight it, gang. Do not let yourself buy into that. Because if you go into an audition room going, and this is what I did straight off of a series, I was like, I need a job. <laughs> yeah. Weirdly, I didn't get one. If, I highly recommend everyone watch this documentary that's interesting called That Guy Who Was In That Thing. It's literally oh. called That Guy dot 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 who was in that thing. And it interviews 16 character actors about the ups and downs of their careers. And one of my favorite is Bruce Davidson talking about not wanting to do auditions versus wanting auditions. And he says, essentially paraphrasing, when you walk into an audition room and you want it, it emanates off you. They can smell it. And he's like, yeah, but every single time I'm like sick, say this during COVID, but like, I'm sick. I don't want to go to an audition. You have to go. I don't want to go. Ugh. That's the one you book. And yeah. if you remember that in your mentality, like, <laughs> you know, what's really funny is I'm going to say to you, you, mm -hmm. something that was said to me that all the time make me laugh because I don't agree with it. I'm not worried about you. And every time that's said to me, I'm like, well, I am. But <laughs> just so you know, like literally, this is the funny thing about outsider versus inside. I'm like, you're going to book something huge soon. Meanwhile, I look in the mirror and I'm like, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> well, David, I'll see you in my pack up town because we'll be there together with the little pole and the food on our thing. It's like, hey, bud. <laughs> We're going to have a new podcast called Two Cardboard Boxes. You can find us on the overpass. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, D. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>